you, Alan and Kanda, for reading our scripture. And uh, Alan, we're not quite sure how much longer uh, will be. Uh, I mean, I, what will be plenty of. Actually, we we are sure that virtual is here to stay with us for for a while. Even when we go back to in-person worship services, there'll be a a, a dual, uh, you know, in-person and and virtual. So maybe in the future we can add you to our our list of a pulpit supply, and and you can bring the word from Florida to us. <laughs> thank you. Um, also, thank you to our musicians for leading us in our music, our worship music this morning. Uh, to Brady and Barbara and our soloist, Jean. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we continue our series on God and the pandemic, a series that's inviting us to reflect on our current uh, life situation with the pandemic and, and God's character and our response as followers of, of Jesus. And this morning, I want to begin with the final verse of our, our scripture reading uh, that Alan and Kanda uh, read. And that is, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I thought we could try something new today to try to make the sermon experience a little more interactive. So I wanted to take a poll about this verse. And if Irene could uh, uh, put it, the poll up on the screen at this time, uh, hopefully this will, will work for us. We're going to try something new. I think, Irene, all you have to do is hit the the poll button on the bottom there. Uh, I think you know um, what's happening. Um, anyone see the the poll there? No, I see shaking of heads. Yeah, who else logged in as GraceNet? I think you control the poll right now. Is it? Yeah. Do you have the poll? Yep. Yep. All right, Casey. If you could put it, there, we go. All right. So, so the first question you'll see there is, is, do you consider the Bible verse, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, a hard saying? So you can simply respond to that question, uh, yes or yes or no. Do you consider that a hard biblical saying? Um, yes or no. Um, let's see here. So, so that's the first question, yes or no. You can simply respond with yes or no when you hear that passage. Do you hear it as a hard biblical saying or not? Uh, retired biblical theology professor Manfred Brock, who's well known to many in this congregation, he, he would have answered yes to this poll question. He writes, uh, the apparent discrepancy between its profound affirmation of faith and our human experience makes Romans 8.28 one of the difficult sayings of the Apostle Paul. Now, so let's do one more poll question this morning. Uh, it's also there. You can see it and you can submit your your response. When, when something bad happens and someone responds with, uh, it's okay, we, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, how do you feel in that moment when someone responds that way? Uh, do you feel comforted a little? Uh, do you feel comforted a lot? Or do you feel a little discomfort, either a little or a lot? So if you can answer those questions and then submit them, and then I think Casey will be able to to uh, uh, share the results with us, I believe. Um, and, and the results are anonymous. Uh, the poll is anonymous, so no one's tracking your answers. Uh, so it's safe. You don't have to worry about someone re re reaching out to you that you answered a certain way or not. Um, I, I've never done this polling before. It's a little fun to take an instant poll of the congregation. Um, and I, Irene and Casey, I don't know if you're able to, to figure out how to, how to share those results. We're going to share our screen. Okay. So everyone can see it, but then I'll tell you for those that are on, um, Great. phone. So, um, the first question, do you consider the Bible verse? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who are loved is hard saying 33 answered and 21 which is 64% said yes, and 13, which is 39% said no. Sorry, Casey, I think you're sharing the wrong screen, but. We are? Mm. Sorry. Uh, let's try again. Can it not be shared then? I wonder if you have to hit N. Oh, maybe we can share it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, well, I'll continue though. That was great. The verbal, the verbal, 
response is great. She said 64% said yes yep. and 36% said no. All right, very good. 39. And number two, when something bad happens and someone responds with, it's okay, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Do you feel a little comfort? Comforted a little, which was 30%. 33 people responded, 30% said they felt comforted a little. For comforted a lot, 33%. For discomforted a little, 30%. And discomforted a lot, 6%. Okay. Well, I got to learn a little bit about the church this morning through that poll. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so thank you for, for responding. Um, to you, to, to those questions. That, that, that's, hey, there they are. Uh, the host is sharing poll results there. So you can see the results up on your screen or they're on my screen. I, I assume they're on your screen as well. Um, so there, there you go with those, those response. So uh, we learned something about each other uh, this morning. So if you, if you place yourself in one of those situations um, when something bad happens, Dr. Brauch writes in his book, how can we see the hand of God at work when a young child is killed by a drunken driver? What measure of good can be discerned when a Christian congregation is killed by uh, radical uh, guerrillas? Or how do we make sense of the tragedy that happened this past week in Beirut, Lebanon? Or where is God's loving purpose revealed in the agony of someone dying alone because of COVID-19? These kinds of present realities in our lives sometimes can seem to contradict Paul's affirmations that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so Brock says, because of this apparent contradiction, it's important to understand what it is that is being said in this verse in this passage. Before saying more, I want to acknowledge that for many of us, as, as was revealed in the poll, uh, for many of us, uh, my, uh, these words bring, bring comfort to us. And, and for many, we were brought up with this affirmation in since the King James translation, that all things work together for the good of those who love God, that there's comfort in this. Along my Christian journey, uh, the original comfort I derived from this passage has been challenged. Um, I remember the first time that happened. Uh, I was working with students in South Africa, and they were studying peace building and conflict resolution. Uh, they were studying how a society and how Christians were trying to, to rebuild a, a society into a more just society after it had been subjected uh, to injustice for far too long uh, through the apartheid government. Um, these students study different themes each week, such as truth and reconciliation and forgiveness. Uh, they studied brokenness and community. And, and one theme was a, a week of trauma, wounding, and healing. And they were studying that theme or that day when one of the co-leaders of, of, of the experience quoted this biblical passage and openly questioned the standard traditional interpretation. And she mentioned different traumas people may go through and she categorically stated her opposition to the idea that God would use that trauma to bring good. And she simply said to the students, God did not want that to happen to you. And I remember being challenged by this. And, and I remember the students, uh, many from Christian colleges, were also challenged by what she said. And, and, and so I, I recognize uh, the sermon journey I want to go on with you this morning may be challenging. Uh, but this is a conversation. Um, and I know I'll be doing most of the talking, but I hope over time that we can, you know, continue conversations and continue with talking with each other about some of these hard, what, what I would consider and what Dr. Brock considers a hard saying of, of Paul. Um, it's an opportunity to take what we've been handed down and to hold it up to the light of scripture, that we might respond faithfully to God's call in the present. In order to understand this passage, we need to hear it in the context of the entire passage of of Romans chapter eight. And when we do, we discover our present vocation, our work, God's call to us for this present time. We're gonna focus on verses 18 to 28, but before jumping to verse 18, I want to mention 
that when you read the entirety of, of Romans chapter 8, you'll find that it's filled with faith and hope. And I invite you to, if you have your Bible, to open to Romans chapter 8 this morning. It begins with these words, uh, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. That's the opening. The closing is this. It's a great doxology, a great praise and thanksgiving to God. Uh, I mentioned it to the kids. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. N.T. Wright calls this a house we all want to live in. Romans 8 emphasizes victory over the dark powers inside us and outside of us. It emphasizes security in the present age and in the age to come. And yet between the beginning and the end, there's this middle passage that's a little less familiar to us. We, we might skip over it. It's a little less hopeful than the beginning and the end, a little harder to understand. Uh, verse 11 declares that Jesus' followers have received God's spirit and are being led by that spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is, is living in us. And this is the basis of verses 16 and 17, which if you follow along, says that the Spirit himself testifies, meaning the Spirit gives supporting witness to what our own Spirit is saying, that we are God's children. And if we are children, we are also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of the Messiah, as long as we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. In these verses, there's a, a present, but not fully present dynamic, an already, but a not yet. Uh, Dr. Brock uh, would say, uh, I was saved, right? Verse 24, it says, for in this hope we were saved, but we are or will be saved fully in the age to come. He would often say, uh, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. We are free uh, from sin, but just because we are freed from bondage to sin and death does not mean we do not experience in present the reality of sin, suffering, or death. It is part of the path we walk in life. If you think about the Israelites' exodus from Egypt, just as it was not easy for them to, to leave Egypt and, and reach their promised inheritance, so, so, so our journey is not easy either. But, but Paul quickly shares where we pick up our scripture this morning's reading. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And let's ask a, a good Bible study question here. What is this glory that will be revealed to us? Many think that this is referring to, to some distant inheritance in heaven. But that's not what the passage says. There's not a talk of a future home in heaven of disembodied souls. Rather, in verse 11, Paul points to the future resurrection of our mortal bodies. And in verses 19 through 21, we hear of creation itself eagerly waiting in expectation for God's children to be revealed. The creation waits for the children of God to be revealed. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So you see, just as God sent Jesus to rescue humanity, so, so God sends Jesus as co-heirs, right? We're co-heirs with Christ. We are his brothers and sisters. Remember how Jesus redefined who his family was in the Gospel of Luke? When told his mother and brothers were sitting outside wanting to talk to him, Jesus replied, my mother and brothers are those who do the will of God. And so Jesus sends his brothers and sisters in the power of the Spirit to rescue the whole creation, for us to be liberated from its bondage to decay. We are to be image bearers of Christ. And God does this work through us. We partner with God in doing the work. So what does this mean in practice? In practice, what it means is found in verses 22 and 27. It's found in these 
and, and kind of a, a three part groaning. And, and um, Irene, you can put this screen up on the page for people to follow along if you wish. Um, there is the groaning of the world. In verse 22, it says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And then there's the groaning of the church. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly, right? As we wait eagerly for our adoption as children of God, the redemption of our physical bodies. It is in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The groaning of the spirit within the church, within the world, is the third party. As I talk to the children, uh, the, the, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So what is our present vocation to be? We are to be caught up in the same groaning of creation, of the church, and of the spirit. We as followers of, of Jesus are, are to be caught up in this groaning. And it says so much about Grace Baptist Church that when all this began, one of the first actions you took as, as, as a faith community was to renew your prayer life. You, you started a Thursday evening prayer group in addition to other small groups that were already meeting. You, you've re-emphasized prayer and the sharing of prayer concerns and praises during Sunday morning worship. And, and, and just look at how God was preparing you for this moment. Before the pandemic hit, you were already thinking of the importance of prayer with your developing church growth plan back in January and February. This past week, I learned that you were renewing your, that renewing your prayer life was one of your first priorities to that plan. And part of that was developing a book club, and that, that book club is reading and discussing together a book about prayer. And so our vocation in this present moment is not to be commenting from the sidelines or telling others that there's a meaning to decode, what, what meaning there is to decode in these current event, events. Instead, it's to be a people of prayer. In these moments that we currently find ourselves in, it's, we become painfully aware of the big gap between the people we are right now, you know, in our weakness, that we're susceptible to, to sickness and to sin and death, and the people we shall be, that we shall be risen from the dead into a glorious and new immortal physicality. There's a big gap, but in between those two things, the already and the not yet, we're called to be people of prayer. And sometimes we don't know what to pray for. We find ourselves in a kind of exile, a kind of not being in control. And it's in that very moment we discover that God's very own self is groaning as well without words. This reminds me of that story uh, that Ellie Wiesel tells. Ellie Wiesel is a survivor of the Holocaust. And one day uh, the Gestapo hanged a, a, a child. And they were, even the, the Gestapo was disturbed by the prospect of hanging a young boy in front of thousands of people. And the, the child, Ellie Vesel recalled, had a had face of a sad-eyed angel. And he was silent and lividly pale and almost calm as he ascended the gallows. And behind Vesel, one of the other prisoners asked, where is God? Where is he? And it took the child a half hour to die and the prisoners were forced to look him in the face and the same man asked again where is God now and Basil heard a voice within him make this answer where is he here he is he is hanging here on this gallows now this idea of, of, of God being on the gallows with that child or the idea of God weeping alone with us it might be a challenging idea to anyone who has a strong desire for God to be in control at all times. Such a person might quote our final verse of the scripture passage. All things work together for good. God's still in control. 
I recognize for some that may be a comforting thought, but as our, our, our poll revealed, it is also troubling to some. Are we to passively accept what is happening? To just have a stoic acceptance of bad things? Is that to be our response to the coronavirus disaster? In his book, God in the Pandemic, N.T. Wright shares an alternative interpretation of Romans 8.28 that while occasionally accepted has never been widely accepted. If you look in your New International Version Bible, if you have that version, you'll see a footnote and in it it's mentioned in that footnote. And I share it this morning for your consideration if like me at times you can be discomforted or find this to be a hard saying of Paul. And there's two matters with this passage. First, the matter is, what is the subject of the sentence? The King James Version takes the subject to be all things work together. But verses 27 and 28 is actually one big run-on sentence. The Apostle Paul spoke in a run-on sentence there. And in verse 27, the actor is God, the one who searches our hearts. And if God is the actor, the subject in verse 27, it makes sense that God would be the subject in verse 28. So instead of all things work together, the translation would be God works. And the second matter to consider is the verb works together. The NIV translates it to work for the benefit of. The challenge with that translation is the verb doesn't mean that. It means to work with. The Greek verb is synergeo. It means work together. Sin means together, and the erg bit means work. And so the alternative uh, interpretation or the alternative translation, I should say, of the passage you end up with is this. God works all things towards ultimate good with and through those who love him. And so verse 28 is not calling us to a stoic resignation of the current state of affairs. Rather, it is calling us to hard work, knowing that God is working through us and in us. So our present vocation is not just to pray, not just to lament, but also to get to work, to live out the purpose for which we were called. And that purpose is the same purpose Jesus had in his life, to be a signpost of God's kingdom, to heal the sick, to provide for the poor, to campaign for justice, to bring comfort to those who grieve. Next Sunday, We'll close the series of sermons by seeing how the early church did just those things. And we'll see how the questions the early church guided them in their response to the upheaval they faced and how those questions can guide us today. Until then, I hope you will know that our present vocation is not only to lament, but also to labor in pursuit of the calling to which God has called us to work with God, to participate in God's work as God brings good through all situations. Amen.